talk a bit today about um, uh, the problem that, the, that we were, were solving, which is how to take sequencing the opposite direction and go and sequence as little as possible of a sample and turn that into to something useful and, and, and actionable. Um, and so I'll sort of give an overview to start of how we see uh, the genome sequencing market, partially from a, from a business angle. Uh, and, and then I'll show some data, both in humans and, and dogs, uh, for how we've used low-pass sequencing uh, in both R&D and in, in production uh, efforts. And so what, what we saw, uh, and what, what if, we, if we look out in the world, what we see, where, where's the actual growth in the, in the genomics industry in terms of, not necessarily in terms of, uh, of revenue, but in terms of just samples uh, processed with uh, uh, genomics technologies. Uh, uh, so they, they generally fall into a couple of classes. So on, on the left there is the number of consumer genetic tests done per, per year, uh, up from, I believe, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands, maybe uh, per year, maybe eight years ago, up to last year, I think this, uh, the, this slide is actually understating it, about 12 million uh, uh, humans were, 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 uh, were, were processed by either consumer or wellness type companies. Um, and then on the right, I'm showing you this sort of revolution in agriculture. So about 10 years ago, zero cattle were, uh, had any genetic testing done on them per year. Uh, and last year, it's probably in the millions uh, of cattle. And the same sort of thing is playing out uh, in different uh, agricultural parts of, the, parts of the industry, where genetics is, is helping in breeding and helping in, 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 uh, in diagnosis. And as, as people in this room probably know, uh, one thing that's kind of interesting about these types of plots is that this, all of this growth, or none of this growth, is due to, uh, has been touched by sequencing technologies. There's not a single sequencing technology that has uh, contributed to the genotype cattle or maybe a small bit into uh, consumer genomics in humans. Uh, all of this is with genotyping arrays. So sort of technology, as, you, as you're all aware, where you decide ahead of time uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of SNPs that you want to look at in a genome, um, and, and you put those on an array, and there are a number of different technologies you can do, uh, you use to, to look at those. Um, and so the, the, despite the sort of massive decreases in sequencing cost, the high growth parts of genomics are, are dominated by genotyping arrays. Um, but of course, we think that's going to change, right? So uh, as, as you all know, the cost to sequence a human genome is, is now around $1,000 or something like that. Um, and so the argument is uh, that sequencing-based uh, applications will sort of take over uh, everything genotyping-based starting now and over the next, uh, over the next uh, few years. Um, and, and this is simply because the, the nominal price to, to sequence a megabase of a genome, so a million bases, is less than, less than a cent. Uh, and continues to drop uh, fairly rapidly. Um, and so the, the way we sort of see this, uh, and so what, what we noticed when, when we were starting our company was that we think we can do this now, start moving these sort of genotyping-based uh, uh, industries over to sequencing. Um, and so this is uh, through a technology called low-pass sequencing, uh, where uh, instead of sequencing the 30x of a genome, you sequence less, and usually much less. And so our most popular product is a 0.4x coverage human genome, meaning we, we sequence on average uh, a 0.4x uh, of, uh, of a genome. And so what are the advantages of something like this? So one, it's species agnostic. Uh, if you want to design a genotyping array in a new species, that takes uh, a substantial investment, whereas sequencing it has DNA, you can sequence it. Um, there are fewer ascertainment biases. You don't need to know ahead of time the genetic variance that you're going to look at. Uh, you get more data than a genotyping array, and it's much less uh, expensive than de doing deep whole genome sequencing. Um, and in order to actually get this, um, this type of technology working in a, in a practical way, uh, there are a couple of requirements. So some of these are low-cost, things like low-cost library prep, uh, and, and we've worked with a number of companies in that area and developed our own. Um, and uh, where we've focused our efforts is on improved analytics. And so what we do is we've developed a suite of software tools uh, that enable applications that were previously not possible with uh, very low coverage uh, genome sequences. And so again, we're talking about things like a 0.4x coverage genome sequence. Uh, so one is, and I'll get into some of the details of these uh, in a little bit, uh, some of the algorithms that, that we work on. Uh, so one is high quality variant calls, so genotype imputation algorithms that let us take 0.4x coverage uh, uh, of a genome using large reference data sets of deep whole genome sequences that exist. Uh, to make actual high-quality variant calls. Uh, things like ancestry analysis, 
uh, and things like disease risk uh, trait scores. And I'll sort of mention a bit of the polygenic risk score profiling uh, work that we're doing. Uh, and that's in humans. And then in, in agricultural species, it's the, the, it's the same sort of concept, but it's called breeding values. Um, and so we work with companies in a, in a couple different ways. Uh, in, in one class of company, we actually run this whole thing as a service. So customers send us their samples. Uh, we do DNA extraction, library prep, all the multiplex sequencing, uh, and, and the analytics. Uh, and so an example customer there is, is Darwin's Arc. Uh, it's a, a consumer dog sequencing uh, project out of, out of the Broad Institute. If you have dogs that you want to contribute to citizen science and learn about their ancestry, send them to us. Um, and then the and so. Uh, other companies, of course, have their own sequencers, um, and so if a company has its own sequencers, we provide our software uh, as a service. An example here, here is BGI, uh, who, who now, uh, since they didn't have a genotyping array product um, they, to compete with Illumina in that, in that space, they now have a low-pass sequencing uh, product using our software. Um, and so how, how does this actually work? Uh, I'll, I'll show you a bit of data. So some of this is the vast majority will be on that first part there, data, data in humans. Then I'll mention a bit of, uh, uh, of some of the dog data. And so in order to get this all, all up and running, the, the real challenge here is, as you can imagine, is variant calling from low-pass sequencing data required a bunch of new uh, algorithms. Um, and so if, if you look at a, a plot like this, this is sort of what uh, genotype imputation looks like. Let's see if this works. Yeah. So uh, this is what uh, the, the actual low-pass sequencing data will look like. You imagine this is a, all of these are, are individuals on the, on the x-axis, and these are genetic variants on the y-axis. And the vast majority of these cases were actually, that's a question mark, meaning we didn't, made no measurement, right? Um, and so what we're going to do is going to compare these to reference haplotypes, for example, the, the Thousand Genomes Project, or something like the Haplotype Reference Consortium, or our own sort of custom reference panels, which build up for different species or for select populations. Um, and in uh, a lot of research cases, what, what matters is the imputation R squared. So how well, after you run your algorithm over this, how well does the truth match up to what, you, what you've sort of uh, in, imputed? Uh, and so we develop basically a hidden Markov model type, uh, uh, type approaches to draw a path of an individual's uh, observed genotypes through uh, this type of matrix of, uh, of, of reference haplotypes. And so if you're a genotype imputation sort of connoisseur, this is based on the Lee and Stevens model uh, from, from, uh, from about 15 years ago. Uh, we had to make a number of modifications to, to update it to use sequencing data and to run in, in uh, finite time. Um, and, so, and so how does it work? Um, so I'll show you just a, a little bit of, uh, uh, of simulation data and then real data. Uh, so the simulations are basically, you can divide the Thousand Genomes Project, which is a large uh, uh, reference haplotype project in, in humans. You divide it in half. Uh, just pretend you sequ sequence to low pass half of it and use the other half as, as a reference panel. And since you have the deep sequencing data, then you can actually just you know, simulate, run through the, through the imputation algorithm, and make all the uh, variant calls and see how well you did. Um, and so the, the metric here, again, is this imputation R squared, which is the correlation between the imputed genotypes and the, and the true uh, genotypes. Uh, and so uh, in an African population, so uh, we'll start there, uh, low-pass sequencing inc increases the imputation R squared by uh, substantially. Um, so what I'm showing you here are plots where the x-axis is bins of, of variants of different allele frequency, and the y-axis is that, that, that metric imputation R squared, so how well we're, we're predicting genotypes for variants uh, in these allele frequency classes. Uh, in black is the Illumina Global Screening Array. Uh, in gray is the Affymetrics Precision Medicine Research Array. These are sort of the, the, some of the most commonly used genotyping arrays uh, in, in, for different applications. In red is 0.4x covered sequencing. So again, what I mentioned is our, our most popular type of product. And, uh, and in blue is 1x sequencing. And so what you can see is that in an African population, uh, uh, low-pass sequencing dramatically outperforms uh, uh, genotyping arrays uh, for these types of purposes. And the reason, of course, is partially ascertainment, that genotyping arrays were designed based on maps of genetic variation that were uh, discovered in, in European populations. 
and uh, just reasons of population history, that African populations are, are more diverse. And so in order to, to get high imputation accuracy, you may need to make a lot more measurements, which you can do with sequencing. Um, and so, of course, in a, in a European population, the, the, these curves tighten up a little bit. But again, 1x sequencing outperforms the Illumina uh, or the AFI array in 0.4x sequencing. And then uh, uh, the, the global screening array falls a little bit below them all. And so it increases uh, effective power uh, by, by, some, uh, by some amount, 10 to 20% in this case. And again, so just in terms of, of costs here, I sort of mentioned this, the nominal sequencing cost of 0.4x coverage is, is much less than, uh, than, than that of an array. Uh, our sort of list price is around $50 per sample. Um, and so that, that was simulation data in sort of real data is, is what, 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 what really matters. So this was a collaboration with uh, Charlie Cox and folks at GSK. Uh, so they uh, genotyped 79 individuals on their favorite genotyping array, which is the Affymetrics uh, Precision Medicine Research Array, which we simulated before. Uh, and they sent us the same 79 samples uh, and we sequenced to 1x coverage and then downsampled to different levels of coverage uh, and ran that through our, our pipeline. Um, and so then what you can do is just take the, the imputed uh, low-pass sequencing data and directly compare it to, uh, to genotyping data. <clears throat> and so just as a, as a sanity check, you can just compare the direct genotype calls uh, at the places where, let's say, pretend the genotyping array is the truth and compare the, the low-pass sequencing data to that. Uh, what's the actual uh, concordance here? And so this is split out between uh, positive predictability, so ability to predict a genetic variant that's not in the reference genome, and a negative predictability, ability to predict a, a variant that is in the reference genome. Um, and so uh, this is a harder one, obviously. And so it ranges from 0.4x coverage being at 98.2% concordant up to 99.2% to to concordant. But really, the, the relevant metric isn't necessarily concordance. This is imputation R squared. Um, and so we can compute that. On, on the genotyping array and different levels of coverage. And, and our results basically match up with, with the simulation. So the dotted line in gray, which hopefully you can see, is the genotyping array, uh, which about matches up with 0.4x coverage in this case, like, like it did in our, in our simulations. Basically anything over 0.4x coverage uh, uh, gives a better prediction of the, across the whole genome. <clears throat> and so, this is, that's purely from, a, from an R&D standpoint. So if you wanted to do a, a genome-wide association study and identify genetic variants associated with uh, a disease outcome or pharmacogenomics, that's, that's the approach. Uh, but we're also interested in these sort of downstream applications that are not just uh, variant callings in R&D, R but can we get to things like disease risk prediction and ancestry analysis? Um, and so uh, the answer is yes. I guess I, I wouldn't be telling you otherwise. Uh, so a, as you know, uh, just on the disease risk prediction angle, so risk of common complex disease is influenced by thousands of genetic variants across the genome. And so this is a, one of these Manhattan plots showing a genome-wide association study, in this case for uh, risk of depression. Um, and so on the x-axis is position along the genome. The y-axis is the negative log 10 p-value for association with uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, depression uh, and, and these sort of tr uh, diamond points are, are variants that are significantly associated uh, with the disease outcome. And you can see there are lots of them. Um, and so what you can do is uh, take these genetic variants and combine them into, into a score. So this is uh, a different uh, example of a score from a, um, a, some say Catherison's work uh, for coronary artery disease. Uh, and, and and people fall on a normal distribution, and people on, in the extremes of this distribution, the argument is that they should be uh, at higher risk uh, f for, for heart disease. Um, and this is, again, it's not because of a single genetic variant, it's because of the joint effect of thousands of genetic variants. And some people just by, uh, uh, by um, lack of luck fall in, the, fall in the extreme distribution and have thousands of genetic variants, each of which contribute a small uh, amount to uh, disease risk. And what they show in this paper is that the score is actually predictive. So you can take people <clears throat> that fall in different uh, uh, in categories of this, uh, of this uh, polygenic score, ranging from zero up to, say, the, the 99th percentile here, and then actually ask of these people what fraction ended up developing heart disease. 
and there's a, there's a very wide range here of the people in, in this extreme distribution. It's not that they're predicted to, just predicted to, to have high risk of heart disease. They empirically have a higher risk of, of heart disease. Um, and so in this case, again, it's, uh, this is uh, from, 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 from Sake's work, uh, that the individuals with these highest scores have, uh, have risk of disease that's approximately uh, equivalent to uh, people who have mutations that cause familial hypercholesterolemia. So the argument is this is actually, this is a clinically relevant uh, score. Um, and so what we did was sort of ask, can we estimate these scores from low pass sequencing data? And, the, and based on the, the concordance method, uh, metrics and the, and, the, and the imputation R squared that we just mentioned, uh, it shouldn't surprise you that the answer is yes. So we took a, a different score, also one that predicts uh, heart disease. Uh, and in these uh, R79 individuals, we plot out their, their score from estimated from genotype data and from 1x sequencing data uh, on, on that panel. And over here is that score estimated from genotype data and, uh, and very low coverage data, 0.4x coverage data. And again, so this is, these are correlation R squareds around, uh, around 96, 98, 98%. And so, and one thing I, I do want to point out about this is that if you think about what would be the true gold standard here, uh, it would be deep whole genome sequence. Um, and so I don't want to give, give the impression that the noise around here means that the, the genotype data is, is better. We're in the process of, of testing this, and we think, based on, the, based on those previous results, uh, that if you were to compare uh, the poly, these polygenic scores uh, computed in these different ways to deep whole genome sequence data, that the, the low-pass data would actually uh, outperform uh, the genotyping array, uh, particularly outside of European populations. Um, and again, I, and so, uh, I mentioned this thing about uh, different populations, and, and one thing that, the, that, we, that we've been working on is that the calibration here really needs to be uh, calibrated to different, different ancestries. Um, and that in turn requires high quality ancestry data. Um, and so we've also worked on, on a lot of different applications around ancestry. And this is a, it's a popular sort of uh, a consumer type application it is uh, what is your ancestry? These are things like ancestry DNA and 23andMe. Uh, we can make our own version of that uh, using this 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 type of data. Um, and again, the motivation here is partially that <clears throat> that it, that it's engaging for people, but also that a lot of the the calibration of these risk scores actually does depend on empirically someone's genomic ancestry, not their self-reported ancestry or, or, or anything else, but empirically what is, uh, what is their uh, genomic ancestry. Um, and so we developed software to infer an individual's ancestry percentages from, from low-pass sequencing data. And the, uh, and the method here uh, is, uh, is based on a, a clustering method called structure uh, from years ago. But you assume that there are K populations in the world, and everyone's a mixture of these K populations that have these different allele frequencies. And then imagine I observe in you, you have this genetic variant C at one genetic uh, position across the genome. We can, we can make an educated guess that there's a very slightly increased probability that you're from this population. Uh, but now we have millions of these genetic variants, and so we can get very fine estimates of, 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 of ancestry percentages. Um, and so one, one sort of thing we, we've done with this is uh, working with uh, Chris Mason and colleagues at, at, at Cornell. So what they, were, what they did is just go around and just swab uh, DNA from people's phones, they, or they swabbed the phones and then extracted DNA uh, and asked, uh, c with that level of, of DNA, with very trace amounts of DNA, can you actually predict somebody's ancestry? Because that's, well, it's a very low pass sequencing uh, assay. Um, and, and the answer is yes. So from the, from the majority of phones, uh, some human DNA was recovered and could be used to generate these, these types of, of, of ancestry reports. Here's somebody who uh, self-reports as Ashkenazi Jewish and ends up um, being reported that way from, from this type of ancestry test. And so really what, what the, the point I want to make is that low-pass sequencing provides a, a really powerful tool for a bunch of different applications in human genetics. So one is uh, purely R&D, so increased uh, genome-wide association study power relative to genotyping arrays. Uh, particularly in non-European populations. Um, but then in, in other sorts of uh, uh, not R&D, sort of production type um, um, uh, applications, accurate and cost-effective estimation of polygenic risk scores for complex disease 
um, and accurate ancestry analysis. And again, not just for entertainment, but this is actually a, a very relevant parameter uh, uh, for complex disease risk. <clears throat> and so I'll spend just, I think I have three slides showing that this <clears throat> type of approach is not just ap applicable in humans, but also, also in dogs. This is a co our collaboration with Darwin's Ark. And so this is, uh, this is their slide. They did the same sort of head-to-head -head comparison that, that everybody wants to see, which is take the deep whole genome sequence, take the genotyping array, take uh, low-pass sequencing combined with our analytics, and just run the complete head-to-head -head comparison. So when their costs here are around 1,400, the cost of the genotyping array, uh, genotyping arrays are, are less developed in, in some of these other species, and so they're, they're generally more expensive. Um, and then low-pass sequencing. Um, one relevant parameter for them uh, was that we can, low-pass sequencing requires very low input. Uh, obviously, we're not, we don't require highly complex libraries to do, to do very low coverage uh, sequencing. And this is relevant in uh, animal genetics, where sometimes it's a bit more challenging to, to collect large amounts of DNA. Um, and the other relevant point here is in, in their hands, like, like in humans, uh, in, in some cases, uh, the genotyping array concordance with uh, whole genome sequencing is actually lower than the uh, low pass sequencing. And so for this was a, a no-brainer for them. Hopefully was this is it's cheaper, you get more data, lower failure rate, and actually uh, higher accuracy. Um, and so what they, what they were interested in was um, one of these, uh, uh, this is uh, consumer facing, and so they were running genome-wide association studies in, in, in an R&D setting. So they started with uh, a bit over a thousand dogs, where they'd ask the, the owner of the dog, where does, uh, where does the dog fall on you, on an average person, when, when you're standing next to it? Uh, and the reason you ask this is if you ask a person how tall is a dog, you get back sort of bizarre uh, answers. And so this is a much more, uh, a much more reasonable scale. Um, and so they run a genome-wide association study here and get lots of, lots of peaks. Um, and so this is the same type of plot as before. Uh, from, this is from Kathleen Morrill and Eleanor Carlson at the Broad again uh, on the x-axis position along the genome. And these are these peaks of association with, uh, with dog height. Um, and some of these are, are known. This is the, the insulin growth factor one, which is a, a well-known uh, dog size uh, gene. But they see a number of ones that, are, uh, that uh, were not previously reported, including a gene over here. It's also associated with size in horses. The gene uh, over here, this is also associated uh, with size in cattle. Um, and so, in, 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 again, this is in, in dogs now, so they're getting increased GWAS power relative to genotyping arrays uh, and actually even more accurate genotyping calls off of low-pass sequencing data than, than off of genotyping arrays. Uh, and in this case, it's also another important parameter is that it's effective with even very low amounts of input DNA. Um, and so, that's uh, where, where we stand with humans and dogs, so where are we going now? We're sort of replicating this across species, mostly agricultural species, uh, cattle, corn, uh, and then some uh, uh, model organism type species, uh, mouse and rat. Um, and the key, the key value proposition here is that it's flexible across species. If it has DNA, we can sequence it. Uh, simplifies all, all the workflows. Uh, if you want to be sequencing 20 different uh, species at different times, you don't need 20 different genotyping arrays. You just need to sort it all out after you've done the sequencing. Um, and, and so with that, I'll sort of summarize what, uh, what again, what, what, what we're trying to do here is we think that low-pass sequencing combined with uh, different software solutions, including ours, allow for cost-effective, really high-throughput sequencing-based applications today. Um, so to go after these types of industries that have been dominated by, by, by genotyping arrays. And with that, I will thank everyone involved in this work and mention that, that we are hiring. We're in New York. If anyone wants, uh, wants to come work with us, hiring across science, engineering, sales, business development, you name it. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>